Okay, sorry about that. We're back. Uh, Proverbs 31, Satan is the prince, of, uh, the prince of the air, and he can knock out the sound waves, and uh, I guess the unpronounceable name of God uh, got his attention and shut it down. So uh, we're going to come back at you. Hopefully the audio is working. Uh, audio was not working on one of our platforms. I can't remember what platform it was, but we'll start over. Luckily, it was in the beginning. If you can hear me, put give a thumbs up. Uh, that you're hearing this message. Um, this message is Proverbs 31, as we mentioned uh, before Satan knocked out the, the, the audio. Number 31, as we're mentioning, is, is the unpronounceable name of the Most High God. Uh, and that is uh, very important throughout the scripture. Uh, this is where yesterday we're talking about Martin Luther tried to destroy um, or tried to take the book of Esther out of the canon. And uh, it is uh, God, just like God, to show his glory in the rabbi codes. Every, every seventh letter, they drop the letter, and it, it gives you, a, it gives you a, uh, a code. And that code was Jehovah 31 times. We see in the book of Joshua that Joshua is a type of Christ. His name in Hebrew is Yeshua, just like Jesus' name in Hebrew is Yeshua. God is sal- uh, Jehovah is salvation is what it means in Hebrew. 31 kings he knocked out in the promised land. No coincidence. God doesn't work in coincidence. So the unpronounceable name of God, we've got it up on our uh, broadcast, on our live broadcast, but I'll just show you here. In the English, it's Y-H-W-H. So that's the unpronounceable name of God. And if you try to pronounce the letters, it's yo he va ve That would be the unpronounceable name of God. And the numerical value, what's unique about the Greek and the Hebrew is not only does every letter have a symbol and a meaning, it has a numerical value as well. And God works in numbers, as we, as we know. Every number means something, and that number comes to 31. So that's 31 is the number of God. So this kind of gives us a, 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 um, a clue, since I'm not in uh, Proverbs 31, we'll go there, uh, kind of gives us a clue what the, who this person they're talking about. A lot of scholars have debate, debated over the years, who is this king named Lemiel? Lemiel in Hebrew means for God. El, Lemel is better pr- pronunciation. Remember, El is the singular name for God. Uh, some believe it's an unknown king. Some believe it's Solomon. There's going to be some characteristics of a wife of a king and a real literal ki- a, a, a king. But this is deeper than a king. This is the deeper of the king. This is a king in the order of Melchizedek. Remember, Melchizedek is uh, that the, the order that Jesus will be in. He's not in, the Jesus, he's not in the order of the Levites under the law. He's under a Melchizedek. And the first Melchizedek that we know of in the book of Yasser was Shem. Shem was a Melchizedek, and that's who Abraham tithed to. Melchizedek means Lord and King of Righteousness. Has no genealogy. That's what throws a lot of scholars off. Why? Who is this genealogy? Because it's a title. It's the title of our Messiah, this Christ. And this is pointing this king that, the, that this Lemiel is talking about is for God and is pointing towards the King of Kings, the Lord of Hosts, Melchizedek. Well, it's very fascinating if you uh, study our gospel studies um, when uh, Pontius Pilate put up there in spite to the Jews, King of the Jews, and he put it in the, the three different languages that you can get on our website. If you do the rabbi code of, of what Pilate put on the uh, put up there, King of the Jews, it comes up to Y H W H. So God put in code in His Son, Uve Vave. Isn't that absolutely amazing? Oh, it just gives you chills how glorious God is, and every precise thing He does. Because people wonder why why would Pilate do that? Well, he's giving us a code. He's giving us a code that that is Uve Vave. That is number 31. That is the God of the universe. That is in the order of Melchizedek. So let's invite the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Remember, our Holy Spirit is the third part of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit it gives us the nine gifts of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is what gives us the wisdom and knowledge that the world cannot give us. Remember the Pharisees. They thought they were all intellectual and they worked in their traditions, but they couldn't get it. They didn't understand it. And Jesus talked in parables. Isaiah said he will talk in parables. He will talk in symbols. He will talk in a language that you have to desperately seek him with all your heart and you will find him. And he will reveal himself, what? As simple as a child. It's all the condition of the heart, how you seek him. And you look for the numbers and you look for the symbols. And the more you peel this back, the more the glory of God sits there. So let's see the glory of God. And the last of the Proverbs, Proverb 31, the number of Yuve Vave. 
the words of King Lemuel, the utterance which his mother taught him. What, my son, and what, son of my womb, and what, son of my vows? So this woman, who is this woman? This is, remember when God speaks in these parallel, or in, these, uh, in, the, in, in the word, there's at least two different meanings and a gazillion more meanings the more you get back to the scripture. So he's talking about a literal woman and a literal king. But he's also going deeper. The woman is representing who? The bride, the bride of Christ. So there's what sons of my vows, the vows, the vows of following the Lord most high. Because if we're seeing that if this was truly Bathsheba telling this to Solomon, Solomon didn't listen to his mother because he didn't do these things. This is a king and a higher order, the higher uh, ranking, the king in the order of Melchizedek. Do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to which destroy kings. Is it not for kings, O Lemuel, which means for God? This is not for kings to drink wine. Solomon and David didn't get that one. They didn't get the memo on that. Some say, well, Jesus drank wine. Yeah, he did, he, he did one of the first miracles. He turned water into wine. But we know Jesus was not a drunkard. He drank wine. And back in the, and back in the day, and you know, the big debate in Christians whether you should drink wine or not. And uh, nothing in the scripture tells you that you should not drink wine. It says you should not get drunk. Uh, and, and to put it in perspective, the water that, the, that they used to drink at ceremonies like that. Remember, the Jewish, when Jesus turned the six pillars of water into wine, this was a Jewish wedding. And uh, the weddings would go on for seven days. I mean, we in the United States have a wedding, and it's, what, four hours, and everybody's pickled by the end of the four-hour period, or however long it is. Well, these, these weddings went on for seven days. So the, wa- the, the, the alcohol con- content of the wine back in that time was like a 1 to 45 ratio. You can actually get that on Chuck Missler. I think it's Chuck Missler or Perry Stone did a study on this. It's misconception that, that, that they were drinking regular wine like we do. You know, you go get a bottle of wine. It could be, you could have a, a, one glass and, you, and, and it's too much. Uh, and the content of the alcohol changes so dramatically. Uh, by, but back then, it was very, very watered down. So either way, uh, D- Paul tells us to d- drink a little. W- tells Timothy to drink a little wine for his um, for his stomach, but not to be a drunkard. And that's the, that's the key to this. Don't do not nor for princes into intoxic- intoxicating drink. Why? Because first of all, it goes against God's precepts and commandments. Why does God not want you to drink? Because you you, you lose your, your intelligence, reasoning, and judgment, and the evil one can come. And if you're a king. You don't want to be drunk when the evil one comes. Yeah, David had a history of being uh, a drinker. If you go to Israel and you, you follow on a, a true guide that really knows the history of Israel, they'll tell you that David was, he, he, he threw him back. And if you study our study in Samuel, we, we, we show you uh, that, as, that, that that is true from the scripture as well, because he was in the middle of the afternoon and he was by himself and a king shouldn't be by himself and he shouldn't be in his bed in the middle of the afternoon. I mean, he may have been sleeping one off. So we know Jesus didn't do that. Jesus is the only one. So this is, the, this is a king of a higher order of the order of Melchizedek. Lest they drink and forget the law. So if they, they drink and forget the law, Solomon did. Solomon <laughs> forgot the law. Remember in the book of Genesis, most people don't realize this. In the book of Genesis, some, some scholars will tell you, well, God never intended to have a king. There was never intention to have a king. Well, in Genesis 38, if you follow our Genesis study, in Hebrew code, uh, every seventh letter, uh, it, or actually every 49th, which is a component of seven times seven, he does it in sevens, uh, is uh, in order. It is uh, Boaz, uh, uh, Obed, uh, Jesse, David. So he's got the code that David is going to be king in, in, in the book of Genesis. If you follow our... Um, uh, uh, so Genesis 38, if you follow our book of Ruth study, 10 generations from Perez, uh, David is there, which means that 10 generations from an uh, illegitimate child, which Perez was, from uh, uh, Judah and Tamar, was King David. David was always go- anointed to be the king of Israel, and uh, Judah and Israel in, the, in, in United. Uh, and then, um, so, so uh, D- David... Uh, was always about to be, was always going to be king. So they always, God always had a plan for a king. It's not like God changed his mind and there was king because he put a decree in the law in Genesis what a king should do. The king should not bring up horses from Egypt, which Solomon did. A king should not marry more than one wife, which Solomon did, so did David. Uh, a king should uh, not be above his brethren, uh, which they all, uh, Solomon definitely was. 
and a king shall read the, the law daily. Whoops, they didn't do that. Because if you drink, you get away from the law. You're not reading God's word. You're not knowing his precepts and commandments. He's saying, you know my word. And I will set you free with my word. I, I used to drink, um, and uh, I've, I've mentioned this many times, uh, some of family members or friends that knew, knew me, uh, I drank for years and years and years in business and sc in school and, and stuff like that. And that was one of the last obstacles I had to overcome in, in the Lord. I tried to look for a loophole. I thought, well, if King David can drink, I can drink. I'm going to find the loophole in the Bible so I can drink and go golfing with my friends. But the Holy Spirit convicted me and said, no, son, there are no loopholes. You can't do it. No, moderation, moderation or not at all. If you can't control it, shut it down. So that was 2011 or 2010, and uh, the Lord got my attention. And uh, so there's no loopholes. you got to be obedient to God's precepts and commandments. Give strong drink to him who is perishing. That's who you get so that they, have, they don't feel the pain because they're perishing. They're going away. And wine to those who are bitter of heart. Wine to those who are bitter of heart. They're trying to forget. And forget. The more you put the wine on you, the more you forget. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Open your mouth for the speechless and cause all who are appointed to die. Who can open a mouth of the speechless and cause all who are appointed to die? No king can do that. I mean, a king can say, off with your head. But king can't open your mouth of the speechless. This is showing you somebody that's not a regular king. And it's showing you somebody that's not a regular prophet or a regular priest uh, in the order of, of, of the Levites. Remember in the gospel, under Jewish tradition, a, if, 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 a, if, if a demon got into a person, you were supposed to speak, ask that demon to speak its name because every demon has a demonic name. And once you heard that name, a prophet or a priest could, re could rebuke that demon. The disciples could rebuke that demon. That's where Jesus asked, what is your name? And uh, 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 on, the, uh, on the other side, the, uh, the area of the Golan Heights. He said, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. The 2,000 that went into the pigs that we see in, Mar in the book of Mark. So the only way a priest or a prophet or a man of God could, could actually pull a demon out of a person would be if they said the name of that demon. Well, man, Jesus did it several times. The mute would go up to Jesus and he, pull, he pulled that demon out of there and the people were amazed. They said, we've never seen anything like this because it's impossible, but everything is possible with God. He's more than a prophet. He's, he's more than a priest. He is God in the second hand. He is the son of, son of God. He is the second of the Godhead. He is the, the King of Kings and Lord of Hosts in the order of Melchizedek. Only Christ could pull a demon that was speechless out and they couldn't open their mouth. And that showed you that he is God. Open your mouth and judge, so, and he can appoint them to die. What does that mean? They choose to go away from Melchizedek, the Christ, the Messiah, and the, the, they, they are appointed to die the second death at the white throne judgment. This is the end. This is the end of uh, the, the earthly reign. And this is where our Melchizedek on the seventh day will come down and, and, co and complete the Davidic, or start the Davidic covenant and complete the Davidic covenant. Open your mouth and judge righteously. Only he can judge righteously. There is no king ever born that can judge righteously. And none of the kings did. If you follow the kings in Israel, none of them did. If you follow the kings in Judah, they would go, good king, bad king, good king, bad king. Even if you were a good king, you weren't up to the level that God wanted you to do it. We see that Josiah brought the, the word of the Lord back into the, into the king's palace. After many, many, many years, they weren't doing what the law said. And even Josiah brought, fell short of the glory of the Lord. Hezekiah, one of the good kings of Judah, fell short of the glory of the Lord. There's only one king that can do it righteously, and that is the Melchizedek, the king of kings and lord of hosts. And plead the cause of the poor and needy. Who is Jesus always saying? Plead the cause of the poor and needy. Let the poor and needy come to me. Who can be a virtuous wife? Only a virgin. So now he's got a dual meaning behind this. Yes, a wife of a king, but this is deeper. What are we called if we are truly of Christ? We're called the bride. We're called the church. He is the bridegroom, we are the bride, we're waiting for the husband to come and ask his bride, us, the church, to be united with him. That's why everything is around the Jewish wedding ceremony. That's why everything Jesus did was around the wedding ceremony. If you get a study of the five virgins who had their lamps lit, 
Those were five virgins that were waiting for the bridegroom. The, 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 the lamp represented that they were the church, they were saved. The virgin represent, represents that Christ washed their sins away. The olive oil represented that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were anxiously awaiting the return of the bridegroom. And the other five virgins didn't have their lamp lit. They were, they were saved, but they weren't on fire for the Lord. They weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. They were denying the Spirit and they fell asleep. They weren't ready. And that's why the, the Feast of Shofars represents the five virgins that have their lamps lit and the wedding ceremony. They all go on hand to hand. Jesus told us that you won't know the time of my coming. You will not know the day or the hour. He's very precise, but he says, you hypocrites, you can tell the, 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 by the color of the, the sky what the weather is going to be tomorrow. But you don't understand the seasons. We're moving into a new season as the angels are opening up the last latter day season. But he tells us that in the wedding ceremony that uh, you could come back within, a, the bridegroom could come back within a 48 hour window and you didn't know when the bridegroom was coming back. So the, the, so the, the, the bride had to be ready. She had to be ready with her, her wedding clothing on for the bridegroom would come. It was, a, it was a tradition that was very important. That's the same with the Feast of Shofars. It's the only festival. Uh, and that's why it says Paul re represents the last trump. It's not has anything to do with the, last, the book of Revelation. It has to do with the shofar. It should be called the last shofar. And the shofar is blown on the Feast of Shofars when two witnesses within a 48-hour window can see the crescent moon come in, and that opens up the, the, the Feast of Shofars, the Feast of Trumpets. Same thing with a 48-hour window as the bridegroom coming to get the bride. That's why it's so important to understand the ten virgins and which five. Five is grace, remember, both have grace, but only one will be harpazoed because of the condition of their heart, their church, filled with the Holy Spirit. And you notice they had, they had the church. They were the church. They were holding the lampstand, which we see in the book of Revelation is the church. They weren't in a building. They were in the church. They are the church. We are the church. Don't let anybody tell you the church is in a building. No, 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 no. We are the church. Denominations has got this all wrong. We got to know what the word of the Lord says. That's why we need to know the Old Testament. If you don't know the Old Testament, you're like, well, what, what's the five virgins mean? Everything is explained through the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies? It's based on the condition of our heart. That's the church. Christ is looking for a pure heart that's going to give up their heart for him and are going to be anxiously awaiting his return. It ties to the church of Philadelphia, too. Jesus said to the church of Philadelphia, remember, if you read the seven letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, Jesus said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church is plural. It's seven letters written by Christ himself. Seven is in the number of completion. But only one church was given the promise to be spared the time of Jacob's trouble that the world has never seen. And that was the church of Philadelphia. So we have to study the characteristics of the church of Philadelphia. What did they do? What did they do? They never denied his name. And they never denied his word. The world thought of them as meek and least. But they were on fire. They were the virgin who had their lamp lit. They were anxiously awaiting his return. And what does he say? to the Church of Philadelphia. Because you never denied my name, you never denied my word. I will make you a pillar in my new Jerusalem. Wow. There is no better reward than be a pillar in the new Jerusalem with Christ. Oh, what do we have to look forward to? That's why we want to emulate with our heart the Church of Philadelphia. The heart of the husband safely trusts her. Jesus Christ trusts us when we give him his heart, our heart. So he will no lack of gain. He will guide us in all things. He is our provider. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. <laughs> so true. She seeks wool and flax and willingness works with her hands. We, God wants us to work. The church needs to work with her hands. She is like a merchant ship. She brings her food from afar, the bread of life, spreading the, the food, spreading the, the bread of life. And it's, uh, for the glory of God, it's great to say that his glory is literally in every single nation under the sun. Every nation his glory is in. Five million followers starting to grow on some other platforms because of the Facebook. Uh, we still ask for your prayers on Facebook because they're trying to, uh, their algorithms are trying to lower us down. And uh, uh, the attacking, uh, so far there hasn't been an attack in at least a week, so uh, hopefully that's all rolled together. But God's hands, at his, uh, hands on it. It's his, his, his ministry. We have four His glories today. 
uh, churches in the world, and soon God says we will have his glory nations everywhere. Every single place in the country will have his glory. And he told me in a prophetic word uh, probably a couple of years ago, two years ago maybe, and my mom confirmed it. Uh, she got the same confirmation. I'll read that someday because it's a great... Some of these personal prophecies I've never read that I've gotten and then my mom has confirmed, which is just absolutely amazing. I will get a prophecy and I'll write it down and I'll, and I'll, and I'll say, uh, or I uh, remember it. I'm bad at writing it down. Well, she writes it down. So I'll say, God told me a word and I'll ask her to say, we ask God to give you a word. <laughs> it's just 99.9% .9 of the time is bing, 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 uh, straight on. And that one was be, what I'm getting to, that there's going to be a His Glory Jerusalem. Oh, 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 I can't wait. I'm going to spend two to three months in His Glory Jerusalem. I told my wife that, and she's like, oh, good, just go away. That's what, it's okay, just go away from your family. I said, no, you can come too. You can spend time in Jerusalem. There's more. I'd rather spend time in Jerusalem than Ohio or Michigan or wherever. Jerusalem is the city of truth. Whew. If you haven't been to Jerusalem, Jerusalem changes your life. And that's the city that God puts his name in, in the order of Melchizedek. She also, brings, she also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household, the portion of her maidservants. She considers a field and buys it. For her profit, she plants a vineyard. We're planting for God. We're planting for his, for his glory. We are, the, uh, we are the precipice of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the greatest spirit outpouring even more than Pentecost. And it's going to be the last great harvest, the vineyard. The vineyard's going to be ripe. The harvest is going to be full, but the workers are few. God is saying to you today, saying, I need more workers for my glory. Are you going to go out and with the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit? and bring in this last harvest because these vineyards are being planted. My church, my true church, is planting these vineyards. They're, they're, they're doing the things of the Lord. You want to know what a true church is? Again, the church, as we said, Christ has always said it, it's called the ecclesia in the Greek. It's not the, the, a denomination. There's never been denomination. Man-made denominations. God always intended to be one church, one ecclesia. Remember, Christ is the head. We are the body. That's it. There's no, there's no this church, that church, or this church is better, or this is the only way. It's Christ plus nothing. Christ is the head. We are the body, period. The lampstand is us. We've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But if, if you're following, going to a, following a uh, worship service, we'll say, of Christ instead of a church, because we are the church, if they're not doing outreach to bring in souls, that's what Christ told us to do. What, what are they doing? And then there was a Pew poll done that 99% of, uh, 90, of churches in the United States don't do, don't do altar, uh, altar calls. They don't have an outreach program for souls. <laughs> You're a building. You might as well be a country club. You might as well be testing chili. And watch out for the botulism. She considers and plants a vineyard. She girds her, herself with strength and strengthens her arms. The only strength comes through Christ. Christ is the strength that gives the church the strength. She pre, pre, uh, perceives the merchandise is good, and her lamp does not go out by night. We are the lamp, the lamp stand. We are the church, we are the bride, and her lamp does not go out by night. It never goes out because we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Just like the five virgins who had the lamps lit. She stretches out her hands to the staff, and her hands hold the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor as she reaches out her hands to the needy. That's what God wants us to do. She is not afraid of the snow of her household. The snow, the sins will be a scarlet, but they wash as white as snow. For her household is clothed with scarlet. Kind of cool name. I'd love to have that name, Scarlet. Scarlet, the pureness of God, taking the sins of scarlet and washing them white as snow. She's clothed in scarlet. We'll know that she's clothed in scarlet uh, because these are, these are scarlet and purple and fine linen are, um, are royalty. And it says in the book of Revelation that we'll be kings and priests like, like our king and priest Melchizedek. That's different than the Old Testament. And this would be the type of colors that you would wear, scarlet and purple and fine white linen. She's not afraid to snow, uh, and she's clothed with scarlet. Cool name, Scarlet. Did I mention Scarlet? Okay. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. And her, her husband is known in the gates. Yes, he's known in the gates. Known in the gates means, in ancient Israel, if you studied our study in the book of Ruth, 
Boaz was a leader of the, uh, of the city. He was a kinsman redeemer. He was a blood redeemer. He was a type of Christ. He redeemed Naomi, which is a type of Israel. And he redeemed Ruth, the bride, the Gentile bride, the church. Uh, so the leaders at the gate in the old cities, yes, they had gates, they had walls, and you had to be vetted before they came in. I know our politicians don't want to hear this, but that's in the Bible. That is biblical. Even heaven has walls, and you have to be fully vetted. So they would meet at the gates. The authority of that city, the city council would meet at the gates. That's what he's referring to. He, her husband is known at the gates. It means he has high authority. And there's only one that has high authority, and that is Christ. When he sits among the elders of the land, the elders of the land, he sits among them, but he is in the order of Melchizedek. He's higher. She makes linen garments and sells them and su supplies sashes for the, merchand for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. Back in ancient Israel, it was based on the clothing you wore. And the, in, in, and the authority that you had was based on the hem of your garment. I have a uh, prayer shawl uh, from Israel. You can see the Hebrew on this. This is uh, from the old city of Jerusalem. This would be the tassel of your prayer shawl. This would be the hem of the garment. This would give you authority. The authority of ancient Israel would be similar to like what we would have in the, um, the Marines today. You might be a sergeant or you might be a, a colonel or you might be, my grandfather was a colonel in the Marines and I didn't make it to be a colonel. Uh, I was only a lance corporal. So um, th that would be the, your stripes would show you or your, 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 would show you what rank you are. And that's the way it would be in, in ancient Israel. Remember in our study in the book of Ruth that she put the garment over her feet as the rede redemption because his authority was in the garment. Remember the woman who was bleeding touched the hem of the garment of Christ and she was, she was healed. That's a sign of authority that you, by the hem of the garment. And that's actually the, the tassel here um, on, on, the, on the prayer shawl. So she shall rejoice in the time she opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue is a law of kindness. That's the church. We are we a tongue of law of kindness? Because the old king's wives didn't do that. Well, there was one king's mom that was just a wicked old witch, to say the least. But this was talking about the church once we're cleansed. Do we have the tongue of kindness? And do we have the law on our heart? She watches over the ways of her household, not just her own household, but the household of the ecclesia, the church, and does not eat the bread of idleness. She's not lazy. She's not a, slug she's not a sluggard. We're not called to be sluggards. We are to move forward in the glory of God because tomorrow is never given and God wants us to go out and prepare for the last harvest. Prepare, 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 prepare and invest in those ministries that are going out and sharing the gospel to bring out every soul. Because no matter what we do in the end of the day, it's the soul of people which matter. I mean, we can feed the poor. We can have chili cook-offs. I mean, we can tell you great Bible studies. But at the end of the day, the only important thing is eternal planning. Where is your soul and spirit going to go when your heart stops and we're coming to the end? So we are got to call on this last harvest. Bring them in. We don't have time to do anything other than bring them in by the truckload. And there will be the greatest coming to Jesus Christ in the history of the world And this last great harvest is upon us. Her children rise up and calls her blessed. What a great thing to if your children to call you blessed and uh our children do that to me and my wife, too, because uh, not because we've done anything good, it's because we put Christ first. But he's talking more about the church. Christ is calling her blessed because of him. Our only blessed is because of his righteousness. Her, also, her husband also, he praises her. Yeah, you should, your husband should praise her wife. I think I praise my wife too much. She might be on this, uh, this, this, this uh this taping, so I had to say that, and she's going to say, oh, yeah, are you sure? Not? No, I, 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 I do need to praise her more. Um, I do appreciate her. So this should be worth a lot of bonus points. But, not God, but Jesus is talking about the church here. Her husband also, he praises her. God, Jesus praises us because of our condition of our heart and trust in him with all things. Many da daughters have done well, but you excel, uh, excel them all. Only those who have to, to, to choose Christ as their Lord. As their, as their bridegroom. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. How so true, so true. Charm is deceitful. You can see these charmers coming up from out and they just talk in beautiful talk and you're just like, ah, he's a charmer he's, or she's a charmer. It's deceitful. I know where you're going. Do it with a heart and beauty is passing. Well, beauty passed me when I came out of the womb with my mom and when I got spanked by the doctor, this doctor meant it. But some have beauty, but it passes away. As Solomon says, 
beauty fades and we get older and we get gray hairs and we lose our hairs and we get wrinkles and we got scars all over our bodies to show the warfare that we've been through. It doesn't matter. It's only the love condition of our heart for the Lord. That's all that matters. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. It's more important than the charm that's deceitful and the beauty because it passes away. It's a condition of one's heart. Does she truly love the Lord? Meaning the church and the woman and the men. We have to love the Lord. That's the only thing that's important, not our looks. We're not Instagram models. Yeah, <laughs> my youngest son just got into Instagram. I don't follow Instagram. I mean, his glory is on Instagram, but I don't follow Instagram. We, we don't follow anybody on Instagram. We just put his uh, Bible messages up there. But I saw some of these Instagram models, and I'm like, well, we are definitely in the latter days. These, these, these pouting looks with the lips, and they're like, oh, <laughs> what are they doing? Have we lost our mind? Come on, focus on the Lord. Give her the fruit of her hands. Give her the fruit of her hands. Jesus said, are you a good tree or a bad tree? You're a, the, the, the tree is, 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 is um, judged by what it produces. If you're a good tree, you'll produce good fruit. If you're a bad tree, you'll produce bad fruit. So we're supposed to produce fruit. We're not supposed to judge other people, as Chuck Missler used to famously say. But he also said we can be fruit inspectors. Or do we have the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22? Have we been changed? Are we born again? Or are we that tree that Jesus came up into Jerusalem, the fig tree, and it withered away because it didn't have any fruit? So if you're a tree, which we're all tree, and we should be a life, a tree of life, full of life, are we going to bear fruit? Or are we not going to bear fruit? If we don't bear fruit, we'll be cursed like the fig tree. And if we're going to bear fruit, it's got to be good fruit. And the only way it's good is from him, not from us. And, then, and we'll close out in uh, Proverbs 31, 31. Boy, isn't that interesting? It closes in 31, 31. That's uh, just like God. And let her own works praise her in the gates. Let her own works praise her in the gates. It's, the praise comes from the fruit of the Spirit, from the bridegroom, Christ. Praise her in the gates. That means she's got the authority to enter into the gates. The authority belongs with the king. The king in the order of Melchizedek. The king of kings and the lord of righteousness. We pray that the, our, our daily proverb, or this one went a lot longer, uh, because this was a deeper meaning, Proverbs, and we end in Proverbs 31, 31. The, un, uh, the unpronounceable name of God, God's number 31, yu he va ve how precise God is. May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bless you to next time. God bless you.